numerous numbers of my life. Um, that I was born a couple of centuries too late. And all of my hobbies would seem to reflect that fact, at least until recently. Um, so I think what I'm going to kind of do today is give you background as to what I'm good at and what I've tried, which is a lot of stuff. Um, and then um, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me because it's a huge, gigantic field and I do a bunch of stupid stuff. So if you find anything interesting you'd like to talk about, um, I would be absolutely happy to do so. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give you an overview of, I guess, kind of the blacksmithing stuff I do um, and then some of the other crafts that I work on. And most of them happen to be things that would be like at home in the 1500s. Uh, so, yeah, that's how it's going to work. So, I actually am a blacksmith, and the first thing one would think of when you blacksmith is a forge. So, I was about eight, and I decided that I wanted to be a blacksmith, and of course I needed a forge, so I was tired of just like making a campfire and sticking a nail in and then hammering it down. And then, oh, hey, okay. so, uh, just started. How was your trip? Did you finally get back? Or when did you get back? Got back today, about three hours ago. Um, so I just introduced it. My chat's title is uh, Armory and Blacksmithing and Armory Management for the Discerning Medieval Knight. So I'll be talking mostly about blacksmithing. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Are others not showing up? Um, Rock will be late. Yeah. Uh, I think Sebi's probably going to test still. And then um, uh, I think so. John said he could not. So. You're like smart to see what it is. Uh, well, Jackson is going as well. Oh, okay. Jackson is sure. They weren't responding, so I, I can check. Unless anyone's heard that I've heard from right? my brain. So this is my forge, and I built this because uh, I wanted a forge, and my dad said that uh, he would help me build one. So I took a car tire around, uh, because it was what was lying around. Um, and so I effectively just attached a tube to the bottom of it, put it on a bunch of cinder blocks, and put coal in it, and light it on fire with my map gas torch, uh, and then called it a day. Um, I also always have water, because I'm a very nice person, and I don't cause forest fires. But um, yeah, so that was the only like real problem that my parents had is if I didn't have water. Other than that, I could buy a car whenever I wanted. So that was my hobby. Um, so this is a really like point out forge. I think you've seen bigger ones that have um, a pretty nice scale where you got a whole pile of coal and you just like shuffle them a little bit. All uh, my grandmother actually gave me coal for Christmas one year, uh, which was awesome and both very ironic uh, because it's hard for me to get coal when I'm in the middle of New York or uh, North Carolina, but she was able to find it somewhere because she was. Um, so I use that, and I still have quite a bit of the left. Um, so this is my anvil, again, another Christmas present from my grandmother. And so this is just me kind of sitting on a stump, and that's what I have camera on. So uh, really low tech, but hey, bike smithing is low tech. Uh, and then this is just a sword that I have in my but I like it because it was a good picture of my hand. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about how I actually use the forge later. Um, but the idea is you kind of have to have the heat source, and then you go and you uh, put whatever you're trying to hammer in, and then wait until it's hot, and then have fun and use your hand to hammer. So I started out making knives. This is about seven inches long um, from the center part to the tip. Um, and I was going to make this for my brother. He actually now has it because I didn't finish his time for our college. Um, but I started hammering nails and then just sharpening them, and then I went from there because I get bored with that. Um, so this is actually a file. So I took a file, and it, it is really hard to steal. And so I just sit at a grinder for hours and like wait till it was the right size, um, and then sharpen it up. And then uh, I take and I narrow the other half of it down so that I'd be able to put a handle on it. Um, I'll kind of show you a few examples of that later. Um, I actually do have an example of a knife that I have made, uh, which you can't really know exists because I don't know if you can hear that. So uh, this is a boot knife that I made. Um, so I also did leather working, so I have a sheet. But um, it's kind of like that knife because it's a full tank knife. So I take and I make the blade, and then I narrow down the handle, and then you can actually see the rest of the knife blade through the edge of it. Um, so if you 
you don't like knives or they scare you, you're welcome to just pass it along. Um, but there's also a way to put it if you like. Uh, just don't stab yourself. Although you have a first aid. So, um, so that's what I did for quite a while. Uh, it was pretty fun. It's small. You can sand them. You can just do stuff. Yep. Have you guys handled that? Is there a process? Um, so I would first do that, and then oftentimes I would take and I would um, make the guard. So if you look at the guard as it comes along, um, it's a piece of brass. So I would take and I would drill press a slot in a piece of brass. And then I would take and um, slide that on the tank. So you slide that like washer looking thing on top of it. And then after that, that one's actually cord wrapped. So under the leather, there's a um, piece of hemp rope. So I take and I wrap the, the handle and rope. Um, and then on top of that, I would put the cap of the palm on the end, which is the other little brass washer. Um, and then on top of that, I put leather that I epoxy on. And then on top of that, I put um, the wrapping, which is the copper. Um, so that's how I kind of wrapped it. You can do it different ways. Like a sword always has to have um, wood on it because it's just too big and wouldn't be able to just wrap it up rope around it to hold the Um So that's how I managed to do that for that small thing. That's just like a throwing knife, so it doesn't really have to be sturdy. But um, larger knives do have wood. Um, so once I'm done with this, um, I can either go and I can temper it so I stick to the fire and then wait till it's hot and then quench it, and that makes it uh, harder, um, especially if it's high carbon steel. Um, or I can just leave it like that. It depends on what you're going to do with it. Um, that one is actually not tempered because I do not want it to break when it throws into the tree. Um, of all the stupid things I've done throwing knife related, I threw a tempered file at a tree and it bounced off and promptly hit my mother's windshield and cracked it. So um, I was not expecting that, but it was because it's like a spring steel. Um, so I had to walk in while my mom was making dinner and explain why I had uh, supposedly thrown a knife at my mother's car, uh, which was not actually what I did. It just bounced off the tree. But again, it's not really hard to explain that. So. Um, so beyond that, I moved on to more interesting things. Uh, this is a sword cane that I made. So whenever I would go walking in the neighborhood, I had my cane with me, which I guess is old-fashioned, but it was because it was also spiky. Um, so this thing is about three feet long, so it's like a high. And um, that is the tip of the sword cane, so I took and I sharpened that down. Um, and the entire thing was actually a C-clamp. So you take, it's like a, a gigantic bar clamp um, that you would use to like hold wood together and stuff. I just ripped off the clamp part, and I have this now pretty nice piece of steel in the middle of it. Um, so I would sharpen that up. And then I ended up using a copper pipe as the uh, handle. So this is just a big, like, plumbing piece of copper. Um, and like I did with that knife, I took and I wrapped a bunch of cord around it, put the uh, leather on it, and then wrapped it with wire. So that's the rough handle. And then inside, um, I would actually have, uh, this is the sharp part of the sword cane. And then the actual handle of the sword cane is wrapped in on leather and ribbon up there. And then anyone guess what the top is? That's a plumb bottle. The old fashioned, like you're just hanging from a string. That's the only piece of brass I could find on such short ribbons. So, I don't know, I scrounged around a lot, but it was pretty fun. Um, and my brother was nice enough to hold this for me as I took a picture of it. So, um, and then beyond that, I make a bunch of other fun stuff. So, this is actually something I made for my dad. Um, it's a tomahawk. I don't even know what that's made out of. The guy who the theme around here. But, uh, no, that is actually a railroad spike. Um, so I took a railroad spike uh, legally off of a train run. And uh, I ended up hammering that with my forge and I made a um, tomahawk out of it. So that was a gift for my dad because it was pretty fun. And I enjoyed tomahawk throwing. Um, so you effectively just heat that up and then bash it in a forge. And I'll show you a video of it later. Um, but the idea is, again, you're just heating up and smashing with the hammer. It's very therapeutic. It's pretty long. So, um, that was one thing I did. And then I also have done other stuff. So, I actually did some furnace work. So, um, a furnace is a little difficult because you have to get to a really high temperature. Um, so, I've actually taken and done a bunch of um, stuff. I had sandstone in my yard. So, I took a gigantic block of sandstone, which is this thing over here. Um, so that's effectively tap. That's what they make baby powder of. Um, and the cool thing is, it has no moisture in it, and it's a rock that I can actually carve. So I effectively dug a hole in it, and then I would stick a torch in the edge of it so that it would like, so there's a, a hole right here that would go through so that I could poke my uh, butane torch in it. And then I would effectively have a little cyclone of like butane burning in there. And then you effectively just use a little crucible up there that I'll show you. Um, I use this little thing, a little bitty crucible, and I 
throw that in the uh, in the talc rock and then wait till it heats up. So I burned, uh, I melted like silver a bunch and I've also done uh, aluminum. Um, I have not yet done gold, but that is something that I could do if I were actually brave and had the money. Um, so yeah, it's pretty fun and I enjoy it, but it's a little difficult because you'll always oxidize stuff. Probably. Yeah, so you have to take and you actually use like dish soap to make sure it doesn't oxidize. So um, it was pretty fun because when I went and I worked on Formula Hybrid race car the first semester when I got here, they were thinking about um, casting their um, uprights in aluminum. Uh, and it was hilarious because I was giving a senior advice on how to do lost wax casting uh, because he didn't know what he was doing. Um, effectively, you take and you carve a um, thing out of wax, and then you put it in plaster pairs, and then you very carefully flip that upside down in your mother's oven and heat it up on clean until all the wax falls off. And you hope that you caught all the wax in the bin that you haven't bought the oven. Uh, and then while your parents are sleeping, you hope all the smoke dissipates, and then you have effectively a negative in the uh, in the plaster pairs that you use to do stuff. Um, so that is what I was going to talk to you about next. So this is a good example of some artist rendering of actually how you do that. Um, so say I want to make arrowheads. I would take and I would make a max model of an arrowhead. Um, and then I take and I add a sprue, which is this piece here, which is just a sacrifice. I'm not really part of the arrowhead. Um, but you take and make this entire thing out of wax, and then you effectively shove it in clay or plaster pairs. Um, so this is how they did stuff for like thousands of years. You would take and you would make a model of something. You would add a bunch of clay, you put it in a, a mold, and then you effectively flip the entire thing upside down, melt out all the wax, and then you would pour in gold or whatever you wanted to pour in. And then all of a sudden you have this now metal piece that looks exactly like a wax piece. Um, so it's really low tech, and that's actually what people still do today for art. Um, so it was fun for me because I can melt aluminum. Aluminum's not hard to melt. Um, I can also melt silver if I'm really careful, and I, uh, I don't mind wasting like tens of dollars on silver that would be oxidizing. Um, so in this case, they have arrowheads uh, that were result of that. Um, one actual real reason that this is used, uh, at least up until modern times, um, was for dental work. Um, so my grandfather actually was a dentist. And so he did the lost, lost wax method casting for um, this. So he made me a tie tag that is out of gold. Uh, that is a seahorse that I think people may have seen me wear before. Um, but the idea is the same. They would carve a really small thing of a filling or something like that if you're a dentist, um, or in this case, of a seahorse because it was fun. Um, and they put that in the wax, or if they make that out of wax, they put that in the clay, and then you take and help wax out, and then you have an egg. Um, so that's a really popular thing, and that's something that we've been doing for thousands of years, and overall, pretty interesting way of doing um, various things. Um, so in this case, this is actually an artist doing that with an acetylene torch. Um, so yeah, effectively heating stuff up, pouring it in this um, crucible, and this crucible has a negative that he's trying to work with. And then from there, he'll go in to wash it out and remove the plaster of Paris. Um, the one dangerous thing is if you have any water or wax left in the plaster of Paris, it will explode. So um, I would actually take, and I learned that the hard time the first time, because I was melting lead. So I took a bunch of lead, and I had like this much lead that I was pouring into this cask. Um, and then I had left some water in there or something like that. And uh, the whole thing like broke apart and then a bunch of like lead just like went everywhere. So uh, that was not very very smart for me, I guess. Um, but the way I figured out to get around that is just using a coffee can. Uh, so I would take, I would put the, lock, uh, the wax bottle um, upside down in a coffee can and then I would pour the plaster of Paris around it. Um, and then if the thing exploded, it would like kind of be held by the coffee can so at least it would be one to metal uh, So. I can't do stuff that intricate because I don't have the temperatures required to melt gold. Um, the temperature required to melt aluminum is like, you can do that with a campfire. Uh, it's not that bad. Um, the hard part is keeping it from oxidizing. Um, one interesting thing you pick up, because I did a bunch of metal research, um, anyone know the major export of Iceland? Any guesses? So the major export of Iceland is actually aluminum um, because the cost of smelting aluminum is pretty high. Um, not because it's actually like, not hard to get aluminum, or not because it's not prolific, it's like a really common element. Um, but because when you have to forge, you have to forge it in vacuum. Um, so they actually have to spend a lot of energy to get the furnaces high enough that no oxygen will reach the aluminum or else it'll just burn. So the first couple of times I tried to smell aluminum, I would just burn it up and you wouldn't be able to get anything out of it. Um, but later, and I ended up buying a huge thing of dish detergent. Uh, I think it's borax. So it, I don't know if it's like, I guess it's dish detergent. I don't know. Really know. 
But um, you take and you actually spread that over whatever it is you're doing that's hot, and it makes like an oil layer on it um, so that it won't oxidize. So that's how I got around that. That was pretty cool. So why is this? So the ge geothermal um, energy is really cheap there. Sorry, I guess I didn't finish that. The geothermal um, energy in IC is very, uh, is very cheap. So they're actually able to export the aluminum, which is effectively exporting energy, because it's a process that everyone needs to have done to process. Um, but they can do it so cheap because of their energy. So it's odd. It's like a, it's a cop-out of actually, instead of putting power lines anywhere, they're able to just make something that's very power intensive and then ship alone. So this is actually an example of, of kind of what I was talking about with that. Um, so a jeweler, you will actually take and they will carve your ring um, if you ask for the wedding ring you made um, out of wax. Um, so in this case, this would be a negative um, that they take and carved out of wax. Uh, then this is the screw, that's the gold that is kind of left over. Um, they'll recycle that, that's not that bad. Um, and each of these rings would just be attached to that screw. And then this was upside down and they poured gold into it and then um, were able to smell it. And then once it cools, and then they'll clean it up and they'll, um, they'll sell it as jewelry. So that's the overall process and that's actually kind of what you wish to do today. So. And then this is a fun picture of me. This is me at 14. Uh, I dressed up in my dad's suit of chainmail armor uh, because it was fun and it was healthy. Um, so this is a sword I made, uh, which was the same one that we saw earlier. Uh, and then this is, I think, 23 pounds of chainmail, I think. So it's like three gallons of, uh, of milk being carried on your uh, shoulders. It was pretty fun. It's actually really distributed. Um, but it was really fun, too, because, of course, we had a sword. So my dad and I like took turns poking each other while we were in the, uh, in the armor, which is pretty fun. And I don't know. It was interesting, but at the same time, incredibly heavy. Like, I couldn't imagine actually walking around with it. Um, and Halloween, it was cold enough, but like in the middle of summer, it would have just boiled a lot. Because um, you also have to wear a really thick like uh, wool or, um, or like fleece. Uh, shirt under it, or else you get pinched by all the rings. Um, so it was really just not comfortable, but pretty cool to be walking around for Halloween. So I was happy about that. Um, so on to chainmail. Chainmail is another thing that I do. Um, it's pretty fun, and I I guess it's it's weird because it looks really simple, and it's like it's weaving that's very repetitive and zen-like, I guess, but it's different than it's actually cool. So um, I'm very biased, but uh, this is the type of uh, chainmail that we're all familiar. So this is classic chainmail. If you ever find anyone wearing chainmail, it's going to look like this. Uh, this is what Europeans wore forever and ever and ever. Um, and it's really just a bunch of rings, like every other. Really easy. You can pick this up. I can do it. Uh, it looks kind of difficult, but all these are just split rings. Um, oftentimes, people who uh, were actually using it in like battle would take, and they would rip the rings. Um, so you would take each individual ring. You would have a hole in it, and you have to stick a wire through the hole. And you have to breathe the anvil, and you have to tap to close the ring, and you repeat that um, like 13,000 times to get a suit of uh, chain. So that is a really arduous process, um, but it's also not uh, one of the more fun or decorative examples. Um, so of the people that go to the APO office, um, I did actually finish. Uh, I made my mother a bracelet for Mother's Day, um, and it is chain. So it's a slightly different pattern chain. Um, so it takes, and I think it's a six in one ring. Um, so that type of chain mail is kind of decorative, and you really wouldn't do anything with it, uh, except make a bracelet for your mother, so okay. But um, it's kind of cool because you can do a bunch of different interesting things with it. And it's kind of fun because you can get like gold or silver rings. Um, so that's my hobby, and that's what I do when I'm on the couch and really bored. Um, because I don't have the patience to make a full suit of chain mail, but um, I can do it for fun and get it. Um, this is a different type of chain mail pattern. Um, the same thing, there are so many different ways you can do this. Um, oftentimes you'll see like Japanese armor um, has like a different pattern. They have 